Uh, well, hello everyone. Let me explain to you why it is that you are seeing me up here on the screen and uh, not live and in person. You know, I, uh, uh, I used to say no whenever people would ask me to do a destination wedding because it would take so much time. Uh, I'd have to travel somewhere and by the time you get there and by the time you come back and everything else, you're gone for the whole weekend and it takes away from responsibilities at St. Peter's. Uh, in the last few years, I've said yes to a few destination weddings and I'm almost embarrassed to tell you um, but as you're watching uh, this class right now, um, I uh, last night um, performed a, a wedding on Waikiki Beach uh, in Honolulu uh, on the island of Oahu. So it was kind of hard to say no uh, to, uh, to go on to Hawaii. And so uh, that's where I am right now. And so this time, uh, let's see, you are watching this about 9.30 on Sunday morning. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, where I am, it'll, I'll still be in bed. Hopefully, it'll be about 4.30 uh, Sunday morning where I am. And uh, then later in the day, Debbie and I are going to jump on a plane and hop over to another island where we're going to spend about a week. So anyway, uh, that's what I'm doing. And uh, next week, George Denholm will be with you in person, live. Uh, and so I'm thankful to Dean for recording this today and, and so that you have this with you. So I appreciate the fact that you're here today. And uh, so we're going to spend some time uh, looking at the next lesson. But before I do that, Karen Pinno is here. And uh, Karen is going to uh, speak to you about an, a ministry that she's involved with called Angels of Love. So uh, Karen, uh, come on up and uh, tell us about Angels of Love. All right, so now Dean should have stopped the camera, let it Karen talk. Uh, Karen's probably stepped away, so I'm up again. Here we go. We are on the lesson starting on page 13 of your workbook called um, Our Broken World. That's where we're picking up today. I didn't have any... Um, uh, questions from last week, at least any that I saw. So we're going to go ahead and jump into the material. And also, just to, to simplify things, I chose not to show the 150th anniversary video about the history of St. Peter's because it just complicates things with all the recordings. So we'll come back to that uh, in a couple of weeks when I return. So we're on the lesson called Our Broken uh, World. And uh, we, we left off uh, last time uh, talking about God as creator. And remember, we saw the Louis Giglio video, which uh, I think is just an amazing video, the, the work that he did and the stories that he presented. Uh, and what we, what we know from the account of creation is that after seven days, when God had finished with creation, everything was good. Everything was good. The temperatures were just right, kind of like they probably are in Hawaii, I'm going to guess. I think I was doing some homework and looking ahead of time. Uh, the highs this week are average of 81. The lows are around 69. I think I can love that. Maybe that's kind of what the Garden of Eden um, was like. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, if there were mosquitoes, the mosquitoes didn't bite. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, nobody was afraid of snakes. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve got along perfectly. Everything was good. Uh, but then something happened, and things began to just fall apart. And you and I know that we live in a world that in many ways is broken. Well, how did that happen? Because we know that when God was finished with creation, in fact, if you look at the first verse there on page 13 up at the top, how did humanity fall away from God? Genesis 1.31 says, everything started very good. You know, we look at the first day of creation and God looked down and said it was good. The second day, God said it was good. The third day, God said it was good. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, after the seventh day, God looked down upon all that he had done as he rested and he said it's very good. But we know that the world in which we live right now doesn't have that very good kind of condition. So let's kind of try to figure out why that is. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. So if you'd open up your Bible, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, by the way, if you uh, have not yet put your name on one of the white sheets on the table, if you do that now, that would be helpful uh, in case I forget to remind you a little bit later, but that's beneficial for me. So if you'd be sure to do that. And if you need a workbook, if you need a Bible, uh, they are available on the table over here. Uh, so help yourself to that. They are yours and feel free to help yourself. And if by chance there aren't enough there, there are some in the cabinet over here and and uh, Mark and Brooke can make sure that, that you get those. But we're on Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. So let's take a look at, at the account there. So Genesis chapter 1 gives us a, a linear view of creation. Genesis chapter 2 is not a linear, linear view, like on the first day, the second day, the third day. Genesis chapter 2 stands up above creation, and really the focal point of Genesis chapter 2 is Adam and Eve. 
and God uh, bringing life to, uh, to the first human beings, and then how everything else kind of revolves around that. But in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says, um, And the Lord God commanded the man, that is Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely uh, die. So, on the worksheet, it says God gave humans the ability to choose obedience or disobedience, but he said that there would be consequences to disobedience, uh, mainly uh, death. So you and I live in a world uh, where there's a lot of brokenness to include death. And, and, and God told Adam and Eve, listen, I've given you everything you need. I mean, just take a look at the garden. Everything that you need is here. Uh, but if you choose to do things your way instead of my way, it's going to begin to crumble. You, you just need to understand that my way is better than yours. So if you choose to do it your way, you're going to break uh, what I have put together. Uh, and so they chose to do their own thing, we know, and things began to crumble. So it says that because of, of our sin and our rebellion against God, that one of the things that came into the world was death. And the Bible talks about three different kinds of death. The Bible talks about um, uh, physical death, it talks about spiritual death, and it talks about um, eternal death. And, and we'll unpack those a little bit later. Uh, but God said to Adam and Eve, listen, everything's good, but if you mess with it, um, it's going to begin to shatter. And in fact, it did. So uh, the question that always arises is, why is it, that God, if, if God knows all things, which he does, why is it that God made humans with the ability to rebel? Why didn't God make us so that we couldn't rebel, so that we could live in constant paradise? I'd like to give you my theory for that. I can't prove it to you with chapter and verse, but in the context of all of Scripture and what the Word of God says, I want to talk to you about why I believe God designed us in such a way um, that it, it made us vulnerable to the potential uh, to rebel against God. See, God's desire is that you and I live in a love relationship with Him. Uh, God loves us. The Bible tells us that over and over and over again that God loves us. And God wants to live in a loving relationship with us so that as he has loved us, so we would respond by loving him. In fact, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. So the way that God measures our love for him is not on the basis of uh, do we get goosebumps when we sing certain songs in church. Uh, our love for God is measured by our obedience. If you love me, you will obey me. Uh, and, and so the only way that we can obey and show love is if we also have the potential to disobey. In other words, you can program a computer, right? And the computer will do what you program it to do, but the reality is that a computer cannot love you. A computer can only do what it's commanded to do. There's no emotion in all of that. There's no choice in all of that. And so God could have designed us to be robots, God could have designed us so that in everything that we would do, that it would be exactly uh, in lockstep with the way God designed us to be. But the fact is that robots can't love. Robots can't exhibit love. The only way that we can exhibit love is if we have the opportunity to not exhibit love. The only way that we can truly obey is if we have the ability to disobey. So when God made humans and when God made the angels, he made us with the ability to obey or to disobey. He gave to us what we call free will. Now, we don't have that kind of free will. We, we, people talk about free will. You and I do not possess free will in the same way that Adam and Eve possessed free will before the fall. Because now we are by nature sinful. Now nobody has to teach us how to sin and disobey God. We just do by that naturally. We don't have to teach our children how to throw temper tantrums or how to disobey. They come by that naturally. We call that original sin. Adam and Eve didn't have original sin. Their children did, and all those who followed after them did. So I believe that the reason that God designed us in the way that he did was not because he knew that we were going to disobey and he was going to take delight in punishing us, but because God wants to live in a loving relationship with us. And the only way that we can genuinely demonstrate love is if we have the freedom to not demonstrate love. So, look at Genesis chapter 3 uh, and verse 1 and following. 
So God said that there would be consequences if they chose to disobey. Genesis chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Uh, And he said to the woman, so here's what we find. Remember we said last week or two weeks ago that that God is spirit. And a spirit is a personal being without flesh and blood. We said that the angels were created in spirit form and that God exists in spirit form. Here we find that one of the angels, whose name is Lucifer, by the way, the name Lucifer means light bearer or bearer of light. The Bible talks about the angels being in different ranks, like they're different ranks in the military. Lucifer was a very high-ranking angel. And Lucifer chose to rebel. Um, my guess is that, that Lucifer said, why, why is everybody bowing down to the Creator? You know, again, the angels had free will. Uh, I'd kind of like to do my own thing. Uh, I want to be my own boss. Uh, some of us, you know, what have we heard? You know, I'm the boss of me, or nobody's going to be the boss of me. I'm going to call my own shots. And a life in a relationship with God doesn't view life that way. A life in a relationship with God says, you know what? I'm not the boss. God's the boss. I'm a creature. I have been designed by an all-wise creator who loves me with a perfect love, who knows much better than I do. So I'm going to yield my wishes and my will to him. But Lucifer said, listen, I, nobody's going to be the boss of me. So Lucifer rebelled, and he took some of the other angels with him. We refer to them as the demons. And the Bible speaks about the reality of the devil and the reality of demons. The Apostle Paul speaks about, he says, our fight, our battle is not against flesh and blood. We shouldn't be fighting with one another. We shouldn't be fighting Republicans against Democrats or black versus white or young versus old. Or No. Our battle, he says, is against the enemy, Satan, who comes to steal and kill and destroy. We should be on the same side with one another. If we disagree, we should be having conversations. Why do we disagree? Helping to understand the perspective of the other person. How do we come out with a better solution? Our battle should never be with one another. And yet we fall into that trap. Our battle, the scriptures say, is with the enemy who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Who comes to destroy relationships. Who comes to destroy families. Who comes to destroy churches. Who who seeks to wreak as much havoc as he can to destroy that which we hold valuable. So, we know that Satan now, Lucifer, has taken on the form of a serpent. And he said to the woman, to Eve, did God actually say, did God really say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? I think one of Satan's greatest tricks is when Satan seeks to prompt us to question the truth of the word of God. I think that, you know, there are a lot of things in which we have these satanic groups and and the occult and all these kind of things, but oftentimes their practices are so bizarre that we think, who in the world would ever fall for that? Who would ever want to lean into that? Who would want anything to do with that? That's not of God. I mean, it's just obvious to us, those who are making certain kinds of sacrifices. I mean, there are some who make human sacrifices. I could tell you a horror story of a woman whom I met probably 35 years ago who was raised in a family who were a part of a satanic cult who actually made human sacrifices. And I don't, I'm not going to go into that. We'll maybe talk a little bit about that when we talk about the second commandment, but not for now. But the devil's best trick, I believe, is when the devil tries to make us question the truth, the validity of the Word of God. Because if if maybe God didn't really say this, then maybe God didn't really say that, then maybe God didn't really say this. And that's how he begins here. He says to Eve, did God really say, you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden or the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die, right? Lest you die. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And then look at how Satan responds, Lucifer. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Uh, One of the names that Jesus gives the devil is the father of lies. He's a liar. And then it goes on to say, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eyes, uh, and that the tree was to be desired, 
Notice it says here that it was, that it was uh, good for food, delight to the eyes to be desired. Have you ever noticed how the devil doesn't tempt us with things that are not delightful or pleasing or, you know, I am never, ever, ever tempted to eat, eat too much broccoli. I'm never tempted to eat too much cauliflower. I'm never tempted to eat too many Brussels sprouts. I prefer not to eat any of those things. Now, ice cream is a whole other story. We are tempted. The devil, see, the devil knows that we all have our, our weaknesses. We all have our, our soft spots. The devil knows that we are vulnerable in certain ways. And, and where you are prone to sin may not be where I'm prone to sin. Where I'm prone to fall into sin, you may not be prone to fall into sin. But the devil knows us. He knows our weaknesses. And, and so here he, he begins to tempt uh, Adam, or he begins to tempt Eve, first of all. So then it goes on to say, um, uh, so she, Eve, the woman, took some of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. It says they knew they were naked. Now, this isn't like they grew extra body parts that they had to cover up. No. It's just that before they had nothing to hide. They had nothing to cover up. What they were trying to cover up was not body parts. What they were trying to cover up was sin and guilt. That's what they were trying to cover up. Um, And then it says, and then in verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, that's a rhetorical question. God obviously knows where they are. And he said, I heard, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He knew he'd messed up. Remember we said that everyone can know that God exists according to our conscience. And Adam's conscience kicked in as soon as they messed up. It kicked in, and he said, oops, I'm in big trouble now. And so they try to hide from God. So, very simply, if you're filling the blanks, uh, Eve was tempted Uh, by Satan. So you'll notice there it says in bold print, Satan was created by God as a good angel. God did not make the devil. God made the angels, and Lucifer was one of those angels that God had made, but Lucifer chose to rebel. And we now know Lucifer as Satan, or as uh, the adversary, as the tempter. Uh, There are a number of names given to him. One of the names uh, is Beelzebub, Uh, which literally translated means Lord of the Dunghill. I think that's a very appropriate name for the devil, Lord of the Dunghill. But he rebelled and took others with him. The angels who serve Satan are called demons. So why do we have all this brokenness in the world? Because we have sin in the world. That's why. We have a broken world because sin entered the world. When God was done, everything was good. Everything was perfect. But God said, if you choose to do it your way, you're going to mess up uh, all that I've done. And things are going to begin to crumble. And guess what? They did. They did. The word sin means to miss the mark. Uh, It also means to step over the line. So a couple of illustrations up here. Um, that you can see that the word, so, so let's say if we, you know, Jesus said, uh, you shall not commit adultery. And some would say, well, I've never cheated on my spouse. Uh, I've not committed adultery. But then Jesus says, but I tell you, if you look upon another with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. What? So, so committing adultery, uh, being unfaithful to my spouse might not even, maybe even off the target. I mean, we're not just talking about uh, here. It might be way out here. And we may consider, like, I look upon somebody with lust in my heart, that maybe that's kind of like here. I mean, it's not perfection, but it's not as far off. But sin means to miss the mark. It means to fall short of what God desires of us in our relationship with him, or to step over the line. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. God says, listen, this is how I want you to live. I want you to put me first in your life. I want you to use my name properly. The Sabbath, I want you to uh, experience that in a way that I desire. I want you to respect those whom I put in positions of authority over you. I want you to protect and defend human life. I want you to enjoy the gift of sexuality, but within the boundaries that I've given to you. I want you to protect and defend the, the property 
of, of, of those around you. Uh, I want you to protect the good name and reputation of others. I want you to be content with what I've given to you. That's a very quick summary of the Ten Commandments. And when we choose to do things our way, then we step over the line. And God says, I don't want you to trespass. Don't step over the line. So sin, basically, is when we fall short of what God uh, has instructed us to do, where we have uh, chosen to do things our way instead of his way. So what are the consequences of man's sin? Well, we saw earlier in Genesis chapter 2, if you disobey, you will uh, die. You'll disobey, you will die. And so uh, we saw the three different kinds of death that were up here. Physical death, all of us will one day die physically, unless Jesus first returns. So, so science may discover a cure for certain kinds of cancer, and we hope that they continue to do that. They may discover a cure for heart disease. They may discover a cure for a number of things, but science will never discover a cure for death. And, and that's because they will never discover a cure for sin. So we will all one day die physically. And basically, physical death is ultimately when the soul or the spirit leaves the body. That's, that's physical death from kind of a biblical perspective. So we will never, never, ever have a cure for physical death this side of heaven. It won't exist. Secondly, spiritual death. Spiritual death, we were all born, the Bible says, we came into this world spiritually dead. Uh, the Bible says uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, it says you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. When we came into this world, we were physically alive but spiritually dead. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. And in holy baptism, God comes to us and he gives us new life. He gives us abundant life. He gives us life in Christ. We'll talk about baptism in a couple of weeks. But understand that every single human being, when they come into this world, are spiritually dead. But God's desire is that we be made alive in Christ. That's what it means to be born again. And we'll unpack that as we uh, move forward. Um, the third is eternal death. And eternal death is forever separation from God. Eternal death, for lack of a better word, is hell. Eternal death is to be forever uh, apart from God. Now the reality is that all of us will one day die physically unless Jesus first returns. The reality is all of us have been dead spiritually at one time, but we don't need to walk out of this room spiritually dead. Where there is faith in Christ, there is life. And eternal death is not something that we as Jesus followers should ever have to worry about because we have a home in heaven, not built with human hands, a home that was purchased for with the holy, precious blood of Jesus. So, so, but all of these are a part of the fallout of sin. And with that comes sickness and disease and famine and poverty and brokenness and destruction and prejudice and bigotry and uh, tsunamis and hurricanes that are destructive and, and war. All of that is a part of the fallout of sin. All of that. Romans 6.23, it says um, the wages, oh I'm sorry, Gen Genesis 3. Genesis 3.16-19. Three, Genesis 3, 16 and 19. So earlier we saw the account between Lucifer and Adam and Eve. Now in verse 16 it says, so God has now come, and he's come on the scene. He's looking for Adam and Eve. Where are you? And let's start in verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, he said, Because you have done this, Lucifer, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I don't know... Uh, uh, I don't know, did, did, did serpents have legs before this? I, I don't know, I don't know. And then he says to Lucifer, Lucifer, I'm going to put enmity or strife between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What's that mean? This is the first promise that God gives about the sending of a Messiah. This is the first promise that God gives. And, and so what, what, say, what, what do you mean? God is here saying that I'm going to send someone who's an offspring of the woman. I'm going to send a human being. This is not an extraterrestrial. Um, this is not a, an eagle. It's not a whale. It's not a grizzly. I'm going to send an offspring of the woman, a human being, who Satan is going to address all the havoc that you have just brought forth. 
and, and you're going to bruise his heel. There will be a conflict between you and him. You're going to bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. In the end, he will win. If a snake came into this room, I'm not too big on snakes. And if a snake came into this room, somebody who's braver than I am might go up to the snake and lift up their heel and come down so hard and just crush the head of that snake. But they come down so hard that they, maybe they get a bruised heel. But you and I know that a bruise is only temporary. A bruise doesn't last forever. But in the process, we have crushed the snake. At the cross, at the cross, Jesus was bruised. It says in Isaiah 53, he bruised for our iniquities and our transgressions. Jesus, what happened at the cross was temporary. Yes, he died, but on the third day, he came out of the tomb, right? So, so Satan did, in fact, bruise Jesus. But in the end, Jesus came forth victorious. So I, I think about on Easter Sunday, you know, the Bible says that Jesus, in, in, uh, in our, the Nicene Creed, it says that he descended into hell. And people try to figure out, what does that mean, he descended into hell? And, and there's a lot of, actually, if I were involved in writing that creed, I never would have included it because of all the controversy and all the questions. And there's so little in the scriptures that refer to that. I mean, it is made reference to, but all kinds of debate around it. Here's what I think. Here's my interpretation of Jesus' descent into hell. We know that he suffered hell for us on a cross, but his descent into hell... What I believe is that Jesus, on Easter morning, resurrection morning, before he appeared to the women, he came alive in the tomb. I believe that his first appearance before the women was in hell. I believe that all hell was partying. I mean, can you imagine? They believe that, that the very Son of God that they have defeated they saw him hang lifeless on the cross. They saw his lifeless body being taken down from the cross. They saw him being placed in the tomb. They saw his body being prepared for burial. And now, all of hell is having a party to top all parties. And all of a sudden, they look up and guess who's there? The one who they thought was dead. And I can just imagine Jesus saying, hey, what's, what's going on down here, guys? Uh, what's the party all about? And the look of horror on the face of hell would, would have been an amazing thing to capture. And Jesus descended into hell, I believe, just to say, you didn't win. You didn't win. I said that uh, you could destroy this temple, and in three days it would be raised again. Well, guess what? I was right. And, and, and while the devil and his little demons have not all been destroyed yet, uh, they will. The, the illustration I use is when you go deep sea fishing and you catch one of these great big fish and you bring it into the boat and it's flopping all over the place and it's knocking down lawn chairs and everything else, but it's been hooked. It's been caught. It is not going back in the water. It's been caught. And ultimately, its head will be cut off. And guess what? No more flopping around. No more destruction. When Jesus returns, Satan's head will be cut off as well as the head of all of his little minnows, all of his little demons, and they will be destroyed and cast into the eternal fires forever and ever and ever. So what we find here is that, is that Jesus says to Satan, listen, I'm going to send someone, an offspring of the woman. So people say, well, how are people in the Old Testament saved? I mean, we're saved through Jesus. How are, they're saved in the same way we are. It's just that their faith, Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Moses and King David, their faith was in the, uh, the promise of a Messiah, the promise of a Savior. Our faith is in the promise fulfilled. No different. And then he goes on to say in verse, uh, in verse 16, to the woman, to Eve, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. I will surely uh, multiply your pain in childbearing. So my guess is, is that before all of this happened, before the fall, if Adam and Eve were to had a child, we're not told that they had any children before the fall. And by the way, we don't know when Genesis 3 happened. Did it happen on day 8? Did it happen 6 months later? Did it happen 5 years later? We don't know how much time passed from the time God finished with creation and rested on the 7th day until the fall of Adam and Eve. We have no idea how much time passed. We're not told that. But then it says now, because of your disobedience, 
I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In other words, God says, listen, from now on, th- this is part of the consequence of you choosing to do things your way instead of mine. And, and so childbearing, for those of you who've been there and done that, know that it is not a pleasant experience. And then he goes on to say, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. What's that mean? I, I think what that means is in the marriage, in relationships, there's going to be this conflict. Who's the boss? Lucifer said, you're not the boss of me, God. I'm going to do my own thing. And God never intended in marriage that the husband was to be the boss. When we talk about marriage under the sixth commandment several weeks down the road, we'll unpack what does it mean to say the husband is to be the head of his wife, but it doesn't mean to be the boss. It's, it's much more in a servant uh, kind of role, much more in a spiritual leadership kind of role, but not the boss. But he said, because of sin and its brokenness, you're going to be in conflict with one another. Well, yeah, that happens, doesn't it? And then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and it doesn't mean that it's bad to listen to your wife. In fact, my wife is probably right 98.5% of the time. Uh, But in this case, Eve gave to Adam bad advice. In this case, Adam should have said to Eve, Eve, no, remember what God said. No matter how appealing that might be, no matter how desirous that might be, we've got to obey God. Remember Joseph in the the book of Genesis. Joseph, who was sold by his brothers into slavery. Joseph, uh, who was working for Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife approaches Joseph. And Potiphar's wife, I'm convinced, was a knockout. I'm sure she was a very good-looking lady. And she's trying to put the moves on Joseph. She's trying to lure Joseph. She's trying to seduce Joseph. And Joseph says, listen... Uh, it would be wrong to do that. Uh, you are a married woman. We are not husband and wife. And so Joseph said no. Uh, Joseph, uh, Adam should have done what Joseph did. But Adam chose not to do what Joseph did. And then it says, because you've done that and eaten of the tree of which I commanded, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In other words, now all of a sudden there are going to be thorns and thistles growing up from the ground. There was no need for herbicides or pesticides before Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But now all of a sudden, thorns and thistles and cockleburs and all these kind of things. Uh, And then he says, um, and in pain you shall eat of it uh, all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth uh, for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. In other words, before intending the garden, and by the way, there was work before the fall. Some people think work is bad. Work's not bad. But because of the fall, all of a sudden, it's be- taken on an entirely different feel for us. And, uh, and, and so Adam says, uh, uh, listen, or God says, Adam, it's going to be very different for you. I think maybe I've said it in here before. Why is it that we look forward to Friday and we dread Monday? That's kind of what what God is talking to Adam about here. And then he says, For by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread uh, until you return to the ground, that is, when you die. For out of it you were taken, uh, you are dust. Remember, God made Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and to dust you shall return. That's what happens to the body. When it's buried, it begins to decay, and it begins to break down, and it returns to dust. So, pain and childbearing, the ground will be cursed, and you will uh, die. All of this because the human race chose to do things their way instead of God's way. God said, I had everything just right, but you went and messed it up. You didn't trust me. You chose to, you thought you had a better plan. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. A wage is something that we earn. A wage is something that we work for. And what have we earned because of our disobedience to God? Uh, we have earned what we have gotten. Um, And then Romans 5 says, with sin came death. With sin came death. So science will never discover a cure for death because science will never discover a cure for sin. It is the broken world in which um, we live. So um, on whom has sin had an influence? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. Not some, not most, but all. James chapter 2, verse 10 Anyone who stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. In other words, remember we said that Jesus made the comment, uh, Jesus made the comment that if you, um, 
if, if you uh, commit adultery, obviously that's contrary to the will of God, but if you look upon another with lust in your heart. So um, the lust may be out here, and the adultery may be here, but in the eyes of God, both shatter the perfection of what God created. They both shatter that. So the, the fact is, is that God doesn't grade on the curve. You know, some people think, well, I'm better than most. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. No, sin is sin is sin. Now, there are some sins that may get us thrown into jail. There are some sins that may cause us to lose our job. There are some sins that may cause our spouse to walk out on us. But the reality is, in the eyes of God, sin is sin. And God doesn't, we are all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, so sin is sin, and we have all fallen short. And then Deuteronomy 32 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago says that God is just, and God must punish sin. God must punish sin. The wages of sin is death. So why do we have all this brokenness in the world in which we live? Uh, why do we have death? Why do we have disease? Why do we have divorce? Why do we have war? Why do we have destruction? Why do we have dishonesty? Why do we have racism? Why do we have all this? Um, it, it's part of the, bro- the fallout of the brokenness of the world in which we live. So, so it says there at the bottom of the page, it's seeing man's condition, God seeks to restore the, the broken relationship through his son, uh, Jesus. Okay, so some say, you know, s- some people want to get upset with God when things happen. When, when somebody gets cancer, uh, they get angry with God. Uh, when a tornado comes and levels uh, a community, you know, why didn't God intercede? The reality is, is that all of this is not God's fault. When God was finished, see, sometimes I think God gets blamed for things for which he had no responsibility whatsoever. When when God was finished with creation, everything was good. Everything was good. There were no problems. There were no issues. But when sin entered into the world, uh, then came death, then came destruction, then came disease, then came famine, then came everything else. Uh, God who loves us, sought to do something about that. So let's go to the next lesson, shall we? We're going to start the next lesson, and then uh, we'll get as far as we can get, and then George will pick up there uh, next week. So let's pick up uh, part five, the lesson on Jesus. The lesson on Jesus. So what are some of God's promises about the Savior? So Genesis 3.15, we read that in the last session, or the last um, uh, set of material that said that God told uh, Lucifer, listen, I'm going to send someone, the seed of a woman, who's going to crush your head, Satan, and, uh, and you're not going to win. And so we pick up then, what are some of God's promises? God promised to Adam and Eve immediately after they sinned. Uh, isn't it interesting that Adam and Eve tried to cover up their own nakedness? And they took leaves and tried to make clothing. And it says there, if you read on, that God then uh, took an animal, and from the animal he provided clothing for Adam and Eve. We can't, we can't address our own sin. We can't make it right because of our own. Only God can do that. And even back in the garden, we found God stepping up to take care of Adam and Eve when it came to their sin. So what are some of the other promises? We, we said, I think in the very first week when we were going through the table of contents, how God in the scriptures drops all these little clues to point us toward the one whom he would send as Messiah. So Adam and Eve, all they knew was that God was going to send a human being, an offspring of the woman, uh, who would ultimately be their savior, be their redeemer, uh, be their Messiah, set them free. Uh, but, but that's all they knew. And then God dropped little clues along the way. So then in the day of Abraham. So Abraham lived about 2,000 years before the time of Christ. I don't know how much time passed between Adam and Abraham. I, I can't, I don't know. But, but at the time of Abraham, God said, listen, uh, the Messiah, the one that I promised to Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman, um, he was going to be one of your descendants, Abraham. And then, uh, then he said to Abraham, because Abraham had two sons, uh, uh, Isaac uh, and Ishmael. And so he said he's not going to be descendant of Ishmael, he's going to be descendant of Isaac. And then Isaac had Jacob and Esau. 
And God said, the Messiah is not going to be a descendant of Esau. He's going to be a descendant of Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons. And then God said in the scriptures, he's going to be a descendant of Judah. Uh, we refer to him as the Lion of Judah. And all these little clues that God drops along the way. A little further down the road, he's going to be a descendant of, uh, of uh, King David. Uh, and, so, and then when you read the genealogies of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, they, they list the genealogy of Jesus. Why? Because that was the promise. And then God gives other promises in the book of Isaiah, written about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah says he'll be conceived of a virgin. A virgin. Now, there aren't too many of those, so that kind of narrows it down. Eve, or, or uh, Mary, said to the angel, and the angel said, you're going to give birth, and, and Mary's response, how can this be? I've never been with the man. How can this be? And the angel says, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Also in Isaiah, it says, he will be pierced for our transgressions. He's going to be crucified. And there was no such thing as crucifixion when Isaiah wrote that. Crucifixion was brought into being through the Romans a couple of hundred years before the time of Jesus. Crucifixion was like 500 years off. But God drops all these little clues. Another clue that God gave was to the prophet Micah. And he said through Micah in chapter 5, it says he'll be born in Bethlehem. If you look at that, Micah, toward the back of the Old Testament, uh, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Uh, look at, for the book of, uh, of Micah. And... You may find it before I do here. Let's see, Micah chapter 5, it's on page 866 in the paperback Bible. And it says there in verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, there, see there's more than one Bethlehem, so they want to narrow it down. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Bethlehem was in uh, Judah, in the tribe of Judah, but it was a little town, O little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem only had maybe a couple hundred residents in the time of Jesus. The name Bethlehem means house of bread. Beth means house. Lechem means bread. And Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, we call the bread of life. So uh, he's going to be born um, in Bethlehem. From you shall come forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, of ancient days. He's the eternal one. He always has been. He existed with the Father and the Spirit from before the beginning of time. It's another one of those little clues that God dropped. So again, if we uh, see the map that we have uh, seen before, that Joseph and Mary lived up here in Nazareth in the region of the Galilee. And uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. How did they get down there? Well, uh, Joseph and Mary, when, when they were called to go to register for the census, when Caesar Augustus in Rome, up in this direction in Rome, ordered that everyone be registered um, for the census, they were to go to the home of their most well-known ancestor. And for Joseph and Mary, that was Bethlehem, because David was from the town of Bethlehem. So they come down to Bethlehem, and there he's born. Mary didn't have to make the trip. She didn't have to make, Joseph could have come and registered for them. But Mary also made the trip, and it was in the little town of Bethlehem. And again, as God drops all these little clues, and see, God drops all these clues so that when Messiah finally shows up, and they look at all the, his genealogy and where he was born and how he died, he's the one. He's the one. Isaiah 7, 14, I just made reference to that. He will be born of a virgin. Uh, and why is that significant? Well, it's significant because if Jesus had been conceived in the usual way, not that there's anything wrong with the act of conception, uh, as you know, within the context of marriage, God says, you know, open up the gift of sexuality and enjoy it. But, but the fact is that if Jesus had been conceived by two sinful human beings, even though the act of conception isn't a necessarily a sinful act, uh, but then he would have inherited their sinful nature. Do you understand that? My wife and I didn't have to teach our kids how to be naughty. They inherited that from, from Debbie, right? Or, or from the two of us. We, we are by nature sinful. So Jesus was conceived in a supernatural way. And I remember once when I was visiting another church, I was in high school, and I visited another church, not the one where I grew up, and I remember the Christmas Eve sermon, and the pastor had made the comment to the congregation. He said, listen, he said, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, he said, you don't really need to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You just need to know that he, he came to be your Savior. 
And even as a high school kid, I knew, wait a minute, if he was not conceived of a virgin, that poses a, a problem on a number of levels. So all these clues that God gives along the way, and then again in Isaiah 53, he will be pierced for our transgressions. So uh, then we, we move forward. What are the two natures of Jesus? Um, it says that uh, in, in John chapter 1, uh, verse 14, and we took a look at this uh, before, but in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, the Word Logos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the verse 14, in the Word, uh, Jesus became flesh. He became incarnate. He took on human flesh, that God in spirit form takes on meat. He became human. He, he, took on, uh, he became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to live among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of full of grace and truth. Jesus was God who became man. Jesus had two natures. And again, this is theological language, it's doctrinal language, but the fact is that Jesus was both true God and true man. Uh, it's not that the top half was God and the bottom half was man, or the left half was God and the right half was man, but Jesus was both God and man. Uh, nobody else can fit that bill. A and so he was very unique in who he, he was. And yet, uh, as the God-man, he set aside some of his divine powers. Uh, to do it's like for example the question well wh when are you going to return again Jesus I don't know only the father knows that he kind of he set that aside so he was he was divine and he was human Luke chapter 2 of Jesus says that he was uh, born uh, again that he was human he came into the world uh, born in the same way that we were born Mary had to go through labor just like uh, women go through labor today Luke 24, he had flesh and bones. Again, he was uh, human. Um, John 11, 35, he wept. This was at the grave of his friend Lazarus. You know, some people say, well, you know, when a loved one dies, oh, we shouldn't be sad. It's a lack of faith to grieve. It's a lack of faith to be sad. No, it's just being human. God designed us to be human, and Jesus was human. So when, when Lazarus died, Jesus wept. John chapter 4, it says he became tired. Or in John 19, he became thirsty. Or in John chapter 2, he, became, he experienced anger. Jesus uh, was, human. He was human. It's not a sin to be angry. The Bible says, just don't sin in your anger. In your anger, don't sin. In other words, I may be angry with somebody, but if in my anger I punch him in the nose, that's a different story. Uh, our emo emotions aren't good or bad. Emotions just are. Emotions are just a result of the circumstances around us. So there could be something said or done that in a very short time brings us great joy and jubilation. But could, something could also be said and done that brings us great grief or great anger. So it's not a sin to be angry. The question is, what do we do with that anger? So Jesus was human. But he was also God. John 8, 58. Um, uh, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, where Jesus uh, was uh, with uh, some of the religious leaders, and the religious leaders were boasting that they could claim Abraham as their uh, ancestor. And so they thought they were maybe a little bit better than others. And Jesus said, hey guys, quit your boasting. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. And remember, Yahweh, before Abraham was born, and they picked up stones to stone him. Why? Because he, he declared himself to be Yahweh. He declared himself to be God. Um, uh, and so, again, either Jesus is who he claimed to be, or he's the greatest con man who ever lived. He claimed to be God. Or in John chapter 20, uh, Thomas, after the resurrection, Thomas, when Jesus came back Easter night to where the disciples were, uh, Thomas wasn't there. And then Thomas shows up later after Jesus has left, and they said, oh, Thomas, you missed it. He was here. Thomas says, yeah, right. He said, unless I can see with my own eyes and touch where the nails went. And so the next Sunday, Jesus showed up just for Thomas. You know, Jesus could have said, well, Thomas, you missed it. It's your problem. You should have been there. No, he comes back just for Thomas. And Thomas, by the way, is kind of put down by folks because uh, of his doubting. But, but Thomas, we, there, to me, it's, it's wrong for us to be critical of Thomas. Thomas uh, was martyred. Thomas, after Jesus said, listen, go and make disciples of all nations, some of the disciples went up into the area of Europe. Uh, Thomas went to India. And Thomas started churches on, in India. And Thomas told people about Jesus in India. And Thomas was speared in the back and died a martyr in the south 
um, eastern uh, corner where the town of Chennai is now located, the town where my youngest daughter was born. Thomas died a hero of the faith. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't like to use doubting Thomas. Yes, he questioned some things, but who of us doesn't on occasion? Um, so Thomas, when Thomas saw him that night, and Jesus said, Thomas, look and see. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Um, take a look at Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to look at these two verses, and then we'll, uh, that's where we'll stop for uh, today. But Hebrews chapter 1, that's toward the back of the New Testament. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, right before the book of James. And it is on page uh, 1102. Actually, 11, yeah, 1102 in your paperback Bible. Again, Jesus was true man and true God. He was fully human and fully divine. He claimed to be God. And if he's not, then, he's, then we shouldn't even be wasting our time talking about him. Hebrews chapter 1. And remember, the book of Hebrews was written to Jesus' followers who were Jewish. And it says here in chapter, verse 6, And again, he, speaking of God the Father, brings the firstborn, or the only begotten, speaking of Jesus, into the world. And he says, let all of God's angels worship him. What's he saying? God the Father says, listen, I want all my angels to worship this one who took on flesh. I want all of my angels to worship him. Worship is only to be directed to God. Worship is, it's, it's idolatry if we offer worship to anyone other than God. And the Father says of the Son, angels, you worship him. And then it goes on in verse 7. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, of Jesus, the Father says, your throne, and look at how he refers to him, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Notice that the Father here refers to the Son, Jesus, as God. So, he is worshipped, Hebrews 1, 6, and he is called God by the Father um, in, uh, in Hebrews 1, 8. So, Jesus was both true God and uh, true man. Now, I think as we prepare to wrap up, let's see if I've got another slide there. I'll talk about that later. Um, so, we will come back uh, to that. So, next week, George will be with you. And uh, he will uh, finish off this lesson on Jesus. I, I hate to miss it. I, I'm glad George is teaching it. He'll do a great job. Uh, but I love to teach this next section about Jesus and about what he's accomplished for us. And George will do a great job unpacking all of that. So let me close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you that in spite of our stubbornness and in spite of our rebelliousness, you still love us with a perfect love. And we thank you for demonstrating that love through your son, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us as you have all the way to the cross. God, may we continue to draw closer to you and to appreciate you more fully. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you didn't put your name on one of the white sheets, uh, be sure to do that. And uh, we'll get those collected. And then next week, George will be with you. And the following week, Lord willing, uh, I will pull myself away from the beaches and uh, come back to be with you. So thanks for coming.